open. Feel free to use it, um, uh, especially to ask questions like, what is such and such, or please explain such and such. That, that sort of thing uh, helps everybody, I think. So um, I assume you all know about I, gamma fact, uh, n factorial. It's just the product of the integers from n down to one. Zero factorial is unity. Um, there are various approximations, Sterling's being the simplest and therefore the most useful, although not actually the most accurate. This is the error, and uh, one can see that um, this is Sterling here, and um, uh, actually, no, this is um, Ramanujan's, and these are two of now I've got them backwards here, let's see. Anyway, these are various approximations. It's not important to get straight which is which um, in that picture. Um, let me remind you of Leibniz's rules for um, differentiating the product of two functions. Uh, the rule involves the binomial coefficient, which is a ratio of factorials. The exponential function is defined, of course, in terms of factorials and it has an infinite radius of convergence. Double factorials are defined this way, and zero factorial and minus one factorial are both defined to be equal to one. Now, what's really important is the extension of the uh, factorial from integers to real numbers, or in fact, to complex numbers. And this is done by defining z factorial as being this integral. And um, this is a nicely convergent integral as long as the real part of z is greater than minus one. Otherwise, you have a singularity for small z, uh, small t. And um, yeah, I think I can make this a little bigger. Let me just try to do that. Um, and in particular, zero factorial is then one, and that gives you uh, uh, that, um, and that, that explains why zero factorial is one. And the fact that n factorial for n an integer, if you have t to the n there, you can um, see that this is a standard integral found in all integral tables. And in fact, you can even do it by hand. Um, I'm not gonna do it by hand immediately. The uh, factorial function z minus one factorial defines the, um, gamma function um, for uh, real z, uh, uh, positive values of real z. So this is gamma, this is gamma of z, the gamma function, which is used a great deal in mathematics related to all kinds of things. And it is z minus one factorial. Um, and one can write it as this z is uh, z factorial is gamma of z plus one. I think it's really an unfortunate accident of mathematical history that these guys are defined in different ways. I mean, in other words, one could have defined the factorial function and, and not gamma, and someone wouldn't have this difference of one there. Here is a plot of the um, gamma function. Let, let me just say that um, this gamma function immediately for real z, you need z greater than minus one, uh, greater than one, um, greater than zero, I should say. But um, in fact, this is, <clears throat> is defined for complex, all complex Z, except for zero and the negative integers. And um, in the real plane, it looks like this. There are poles at zero, minus one, minus two, and so forth. But apart from that, it's perfectly fine. If you differentiate the, uh, the, the ordinary gamma function at z plus one is the integral of e to the minus t, um, uh, t to the z dt. And um, e to the minus t is the same thing as minus d by dt of e to the minus t. Then you integrate by parts, there are no surface terms, and um, you wind up with an extra factor of z. So you get the rule gamma, 
of z plus one is z gamma of z. That's uh, a very important uh, rule. And you can iterate it and you can take ratios and uh, you can furthermore write gamma of z in terms of gamma of z plus three apart from poles at zero minus one and minus two. And in that way you can, the phrase we'll learn in the next chapter is you can analytically continue the gamma function throughout the complex plane apart from the poles at zero minus one and the negative integers. Euler has a definition, Weierstrass another. Um, there are these different identities. Um, this is the spherical Bessel function. It, it, the Bessel function itself is um, defined first for integer nu, but by using the gamma function, you can define it for complex nu. And uh, it's, it's a pretty complicated series, frankly, but um, the spherical Bessel function turns out to be vastly simpler, even though when you look at it, you'd say, oh my goodness, L plus a half, L plus a half, that can't be particularly uh, simple. So um, let me just write a note to myself. Um, And in fact, for small values, it's rho to the L over two L plus one double factorial. This is actually something that comes up a lot in um, atomic physics, nuclear physics. Um, the, the, the thing about factorials that surprise, that, that is surprising, and it's even surprising to people who, um, uh, have have been dealing with these things for a long time, and it's how big factorials get so quickly and very quickly. I mean, we think of our computers as being, you know, super fast and so forth. In fact, um, the uh, factorials quickly become too big for computers to handle, and. Um, so there are functions that one can use instead. Um, and, and the reason why it's, these functions are useful is that the final answer is going to be some number like three or two and a half or something. It's not going to be some absurdly large number that like a hundred factorial. Um, and, and consequently, what happens is these um, factorials must eventually cancel in expressions. And so what one can do uh, in order to compute them numerically with computers is to use the logarithm of the factorial. And uh, Fortran has log gamma, C has L gamma, MATLAB has gamma LN, Python has log gamma. I don't know why these guys couldn't have all um, agreed on a particular choice, but anyway, um, these are the different ones and it becomes, uh, oh God, it's particularly, it's, it's useful to, to use these. And in fact, it's essentially, it's, it's in fact um, impossible not to use these if you have a problem that involves large factorials because your, your computer is just gonna say uh, that you computed something at zero or infinity or not a, not a number. Um, N A N. That's the that's the scary uh, message. Um, uh, so there is there's something called the exponential integral defined this way. There's the incomplete gamma function, where you integrate from not from zero but from x, and you can relate them. There's an Euler beta function. Uh, I'll just define it and say that um, you can write it. Well, it's been defined already this way, so obviously you can write it in various ways. There's also a generalization, which is the product of the gamma is divided by the gamma of the sum. Um, Taylor series, you, you learned about these in, in college. Um, if f is a real valued function of a real variable with a continuous nth derivative, the Taylor expansion is, and so you sum up all these derivatives and it's basically a to the n over n factorial nth derivative. That's the thing to remember, a to the n over n factorial nth derivative. 
And the error turns out to be bounded uh, in this way. And it's basically um, the last term, the absolute value of the last term is, is or the penult the term after the, the term, you, the first term you leave out, you take the absolute value of that, um, but evaluate the function somewhere in the interval, um, then that will be um, the, uh, in other words, between X and X plus A, you evaluate the nth derivative there, take the absolute value. That's an, uh, an upper bound on the error. So this is a very nice error bound. And it's, um, it's very tight because the n factorials uh, increase uh, incredibly fast. So these Taylor series are essentially always convergent unless the nth derivative, unless the function, the higher derivative of the functions uh, gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and uh, these things often go to zero. Let me just mention in quantum mechanics, uh, P on the right, of a bra x is h bar over i d by dx of the bra. And so psi of x plus a will let you exponentiate the derivative. You're exponentiating a d by dx, and that in fact translates. And um, that's why this momentum um, this the unitary operator. P is Hermitian, i p is anti-Hermitian, e to the i p is unitary. This is a unitary operator that takes the state x, the bra x to the bra x plus a. Um, so that's a little quantum mechanics that, that's how you should understand this quantum mechanics. Sometimes in these elementary books, um, things are, uh, the magic is emphasized and the mathematics is lost. Um, Taylor series for two or more variables, it's x to the n, y to the m, z to the o, divided by n factorial, m factorial, o factorial, and then a triple derivative. Um, uh, I somehow, when I wrote this book, I originally thought that it was interesting to think of Fourier series as power series, and that may be useful, but I'm going to basically skip it now. The binomial series, well, that's a Taylor series for one plus x to the a, and what you get is an expression like this. Um, just looking at this and doing the ratio test, it seems to me that this um, that this converges for x, absolute value of x less than uh, one. Um, and um, I don't know, if somebody knows better, send me an email or type it in on chat. Um, and so this series, in other words, what I'm saying is for x like x equal to three, this is a divergent series, I think. Um, on the other hand, when n is an, when a is an integer, it's a convergent series because this um, the, the binomial series uh, terminate, terminates. And what happens is you see you have a minus k. If a is an integer, a minus k is eventually going to be minus one, and then the thing terminates. And in fact, this is what happens in quantum mechanics. The quantization arises because your, your solution is given by a series that's divergent, but terminates for special values of certain parameters. And that's the quantization condition. Neutrino oscillations. Well, let me just give you the, uh, the skinny on this. The phase of a particle of energy E and momentum P going a distance L and time T is this. This, by the way, is the action. PL minus ET is actually the classical action. Uh, the action being the time integral of the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. There isn't any potential energy now. And um, an approximation for this, well, first of all, T is essentially L over C because neutrinos are, um, are very, very light particles. And um, so they move at almost the speed of light. Um, so we can um, approximate uh, T by this expression here. Um, and uh, when we expand the square root using the binomial series or whatever, uh, what we get is this expression here. And um, E is essentially CP. And so the 
what is this why is this doing this to me it's torturing me anyway the phase then between uh two such neutrinos with two different masses then is this difference of the square of their the squared masses times the distance they go divided by the energy and uh, apart from factors of c and h bar and um that um was uh, something that was just discovered in the past 50 years. Um, and uh, it, the person who actually was the main discoverer of that got no credit at all for a very long time. And uh, in fact, I think he was, he was a, a very, very old man when, uh, and a sick man when finally he got the Nobel Prize with enormous justification. Um, and um, the, the, the series here um, for uh, X uh, looks uh, something like this, for example. And uh, for one plus X to the one half, one plus X to the minus one half looks like this. Now, um, um, there's also a logarithmic series, which is good to know about. You just do a Taylor series for it. You compute the derivatives, and what you find is they have a very regular pattern. And uh, for log of one plus x, remember log of one is zero. So uh, that's why we compute log of one plus x. It's this series, log of one minus x is that series, and you um, take the logarithm of the ratio, which is the difference of the logs, and then you get this very nice series of odd powers of x divided by 2n plus 1. And um, again, that's certainly a convergent series for x, uh, absolute value of x less than 1. Um, now there's something called a Dirichlet series. This is a series where the nth term is proportional to the zth power, the zth inverse power of an, an integer or the minus zth power of an integer and z can be complex. Um, the, the euler riemann zeta function is an example and you might say, well, this is just a completely crazy function. It's, um, it's sort of the, poster child for Dirichlet series. Um, it converges for real z greater than one and some values are pi squared over six, which is uh, the thing that I computed with MATLAB uh, to do uh, that sim sum. Um, uh, and in fact, you might say, well, we, we can ignore the zeta function it could never enter into physics. Well, indeed, um, the Planck distribution, um, by the way, Planck's son uh, tried to assassinate Hitler uh, during the either the 1930s or early 1940s. Unfortunately, he was caught and then executed. So Max Planck um, had a real tragedy in his life. Um, anyway, he showed, um, apart from starting quantum mechanics by inventing the Planck constant and explaining electromagnetic energy. Um, what he did there was he showed that the energy in a closed cavity, um, a volume V temperature T within a frequency interval D nu is given by this. So nu cubed over this exponential. And this exponential is what cured the um, the divergence in the classical description of um, of the energy of an, uh, an electromagnetic field in a cavity. The total energy then is the integral over nu, and uh, we can do this integral setting x equal to beta h nu, beta being one over kt. You can write it in this form, and you multiply by e to the minus x above and below, and then you expand the bottom. Remember I said to you that the, um, the series one over, Oh God, one, let me just try to get here. And in fact, I'm gonna to switch to red. One over one minus X. This is uh, the sum X to the N. 
And um, so here we're setting X to be E to the minus X. And so we have this sum E to the minus um, N X. And um, uh, the, this sum then uh, looks like this and uh, changing variables, we can write it as um, y cubed e to the minus y dy. Well, that turns out to be the definition of zeta of four. So in fact, the zeta function comes, uh, is actually relevant to physics. And um, one finds that therefore the energy in the cavity is, is t to the fourth. The power radiated is uh, Stefan's constant times the area times t to the fourth, where Stefan's constant is that. The number of photons in the interval is um, this. And um, I don't know why I wrote it in this crazy way, zeta of three, two factorial. I really ought to look at equation 5.115, I think. I think mm -hmm. that's a sort of silly way of writing things. Um, the mean energy of a photon uh, in a in the black body distribution turns out to be, um, of course, it's h nu, h being Planck's constant. It's pi to the fourth zeta over zeta of three times kT, and um, or approximately. Oh, that's interesting. It's approximately e times kT, because e is two point seven. One eight two eight one eight two eight, um, and then of course an infinite series. The poly logarithm. Well, maybe we can skip that. Bernoulli's uh, numbers they're defined as these derivatives at x equals zero. The Taylor series. They're, they're derivatives of uh, the Taylor series for the generating function. Um, the odd ones vanish. The even ones are related to zeta functions. Uh, they pop up in various places, but I don't think we need to uh, stress ourselves out on that topic. Um, asymptotic series, a series, now these occur in physics in various places. Um, an asymptotic series is a series um, that looks kind of like this. And the remainder, in other words, the error namely the function minus uh, Sn, it, um, it should get small as you let x big. So this is a, a series not in powers of a small number, or it is powers of a small number, but the small number is one over a big number, and the big number is one over x. And so you imagine that the big number x to the n, r to the n should go to zero. And um, so that's basically saying that this thing converges quite well. And in that case, one writes uh, this. Uh, some people want to say that x to the n, r to the n, um, as n goes to infinity, should be uh, should diverge. But uh, this is 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 a. Um, a matter of discussion. Not everybody likes this condition. I don't like it particularly. Um, the, the, the key condition here is that as you go out in X, the remainder should go to zero. So there, it's a sort of, it's the, the, the thing about these series is that they, you go out a certain distance and they're pretty good, but they may not actually converge. So that's the situation. Unfortunately, many of the problem, the perturbation theory in physics often leads to an asymptotic series. And um, that's one of the many problems that we get when we try to do perturbation theory, or when we do perturbation theory. Uh, here's an example of an asymptotic series, but I think I'm going to uh, skip that. In physics, they often occur like uh, in terms of a small parameter, and in particular, the WKB and Dyson series for quantum electrodynamics, these are asymptotic series, and so they don't actually converge. Um, there's something that mathematicians have developed in the last, I don't know, 50 or 100 years. I'm not a mathematician, so I don't actually know. 
but it's the ideas of a fractional or complex derivative. And um, if you differentiate x to the w k terms uh, to k times, uh, you get an expression like this. And this is just ordinary differentiation. But now we can express, um, we can in interpret this for arbitrary complex w and arbitrary complex k by using gamma functions. And so we can define the kth derivative of x to the w in terms of gamma functions where this k, yeah, forget about w, w is not, uh, is sort of a spectator. We can make k complex or fractional. And this thing is perfectly well-defined. So this is um, uh, a way of defining fractional and complex derivatives. Um, it it has various uses. I, I wish I had a good, a very nice um, example, but um, I, I don't. Um, if somebody knows of a really good example of this, one that's simple and relevant to something, uh, send me an email or a link or something and I'd be grateful. Um, here's an example of the half derivative of x to the n and um, it uh, turns out to be this complicated expression. And uh, if you square it, uh, so in other words, the square of the half derivative is the full derivative, which I guess is for what you'd expect. Um, here are some electrostatic problems. I, I think this really probably belongs in a course in uh, electrodynamics and um, biophysics. So I'm gonna basically go through this very quickly. Um, for electrostatics, the divergence of, uh, of the electric displacement is the density of free charges. This means free charges that are free to move in and out of the medium and not ones that are bound by molecular forces. Um, so the electrons in an atom uh, are not free charges. Um, in electrostatic problems, uh, curl of E is zero and E is minus grad V. And um, across an, inter an interface, we have these conditions where sigma is the density of surface charge and N is a unit vector perpendicular to the surface. So basically the, the parallel component of E is continuous and the normal component of the electric displacement is the surface charge. And um, an electric field E exerts a charge on a charge Q, a force QE, even in a dielectric. And the electric static energy of a system of dielectrics is the volume integral of D dot E divided by two. Um, I think this uh, we can skip its it's important in biophysics um, and uh, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll encourage you to read through it. Um, uh, let's put it this way. If we, if we run out of material before the class ends, I'll come back to this. Um, infinite products, well, these infinite products are things that, frankly, I always find to be mathematical miracles. Um, uh, it's that's it's really, really just quite remarkable that uh, you can define an infinite product and make sense of it. Um, it's uh, uh, and examples of the sine of z is z times this infinite product, and the cosine is. <clears throat> just this infinite product, uh, the hyperbolic sine and cosine look like this. And um, if you have an infinite product of numbers all greater than unity or all less than unity, um, uh, it converges if and only if the series uh, converges. And um, so in other words, this is true, if and only if that is true. And so the convergence of sums like this 
uh, implies the convergence of the products that we had uh, here and here. So these things, oh, we actually have run out of material um, and we've got um, a good 45 minutes left. My goodness. Um, okay. Uh, maybe I'll go through some of this um, electrostatic business then. Um, uh, well, you know, I don't know. I, th I think I'll just let you read it because it's basically biophysics. Um, so let me let me instead uh, go to, uh, start complex variable theory. And in particular, I'll try to go more slowly. Um, uh, so the first idea is that you have a complex valued function, f of z of a complex variable z. It's differentiable at z with derivative f prime of z. If this limit exists, and here's the important thing, the limit should exist and be unique as z prime approaches z from any direction in the complex plane. So in other words, we've got this point, uh, this point z, and the derivative should exist as z prime approaches z any which way. You see, in ordinary um, calculus, if you have a point x, then x prime can approach from below or x prime can approach from above. But in the complex plane, it can approach in an arbitrary way. Um, so I'd like you to think about this. I'm going to make myself some coffee. I'm really running out of liquid here. I'll be right back. Um, So um, while the coffee's brewing, um, the important thing then is that a complex valued function of a complex variable z is differentiable at z if this limit exists where z prime approaches z from any direction. And that's the key, that's the big difference. Um, so differentiability is a, is a much stronger concept in complex variable theory. And uh, next, we can imagine that we have uh, some point, some point uh, z, and we can imagine that the that the um, that the function is differentiable throughout this whole region, and then. Uh, where, where uh, that is to say, in a small disk about a point, and in fact, this point I'm going to call z0. Um, and what we say is if the function is differentiable in a small disk around a point z0, then f of z is said to be analytic or equivalently holomorphic at z0 and at all points inside the disk. So the disk here is defined as um, absolute value of z minus z zero is less than some radius, uh, which could be very, very small. Um, so that's, um, that's the idea of being uh, analytic at z zero. So if, if a function is differentiable in a small disk about a point, it's said to be analytic at that point. I'm going to use analytic throughout the course. Um, holomorphic is um, another term, but, you know, I mean, it has, it has too many syllables and letters. Um, polynomials. Well, a polynomial is analytic everywhere, and um, to see that uh, the difference between f of z prime and f of z, well, it's n z to the n minus one dz. We divide by dz, 
dz cancels completely, so it doesn't matter how z prime approaches z, and you're left with n z to the n minus one, which you would have guessed uh, to begin with. So the nth derivative of z, the first derivative of z to the n is n z to the n minus one. And um, uh, this is differentiable everywhere. And so we say it is entire. And so uh, in, a function is entire if it's analytic throughout the complex z plane. Um, functions that are not analytic are the absolute value of z or the absolute value of z squared, which is just x squared plus y squared. You might say, well, this is a, an awfully smooth function. Um, uh, in the complex plane, it's just x, it's just the square of the distance from the origin. You know how how much smoother can you get? Why is that not differentiable? Well, what happens is if you compute the derivative <clears throat> about um, the point, uh, let us say the point one zero. So you're do, you're talking about the point one zero in the complex plane. So this is this point here. And um, if you now uh, uh, take the limit in uh, the, the vertical, uh, in, 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 you take the limit as real, the real part, oh, look at this. I did this, this is zero one, sorry. Um, all right, let me see if I can erase this. I'll try to repair that. So this point is one zero, so it's over here. And so then we can imagine approaching this point one zero um, in the real direction directions or in the imaginary directions. And if we have this simple function f, we see we get two different numbers. We get two approaching from on the real axis and um, zero approaching on the imaginary axis. So these are, um, that's, that's what can uh, go wrong. Polynomials are entire um, because they're differentiable. Uh, anywhere. So um, I'd like you to look at this example while I grab my coffee. All right, back. Sorry. Apologize, but it was a committee meeting before this, and I had very little time. Okay, the Cauchy Riemann conditions. Now, these are very important, um, and uh, they let you decide when a function f defined throughout the complex plane, but defined, say, as a function f of x and y. Is it? In, so is this analytic? And the cauchy riemann conditions let you uh, decide that. And um, so what we're going to do is we're going to say this, um, switch to blue. We're going to say f of x and y is equal to u of xy, x and y, plus i v of x and y. And um, we're now going to then apply the criterion of analyticity. And um, what that means is, you see, the, the, the ratio of df over dz converges independently of direction if, if this is equal to some f prime dz over dz, because then the dz cancels. And so the question is, does dz cancel? Well, what is df? Well, df is the partial of u with respect to x 
plus i times the partial of v with respect to x times dx, plus the partial of u with respect to y times dy, plus i times the partial of v with respect to y dy. And we want, if that's equal to f prime, a, no, a complex number times dx plus i dy for all dx and all dy, then uh, we have uh, analyticity, or we, we have at least the function differentiable at this particular point, x, y. And the, the statement that this is independent of direction means that this has to be true for arbitrary dx and arbitrary dy. Well, if you set dy equal to zero, what you get is that this is equal to f prime. If you set dx equal to zero, what you get is that dv dx um, I'm sorry, we're setting dx equal to, we're setting now dx equal to zero. So then this thing is equal to that. And so du dy plus i dv dy is equal to i times f of z or dividing by i, we get this equation. So this is the equation that we get. And now this, one of the things that you must keep in mind, or at least remember when you need to, is that any complex equation is two real equations. So in other words, an equation of the form uh, G is equal to, whoops, G is equal to uh, say three, two. This is that the real part of G is equal to three, and the imaginary part of G is equal to two. So a complex equation is two real equations. And the two real equations here are partial U partial X is equal to partial V partial Y, that's this one, because the I's cancel. And then the other equation is partial V partial X is one over i partial u, or i partial v partial x is one over i partial u partial y, and one over i is minus i, and so canceling the i's, we get this equation. So these are the two uh, equations that will be true. These are the cauchy riemann conditions. So in other words, if the cauchy riemann conditions are true, then we have that the change in the function is proportional to something times the change in the complex plane, the vector in the complex plane, dx plus i dy. And um, that means you have your analytic at that point. And, um, well, I'm sorry, you're differentiable on that point. If you're differentiable in a little disk around that point, then you're analytic at that point. Um, it's useful to rewrite or it's efficient, let me say, to rewrite these cauchy riemann conditions as simply, so let me write them in black, u sub x is equal to v sub y, and v sub x is equal to minus u sub y. And this, of course, is partial u, partial x, equal partial v, partial y, and this is partial v, partial x is minus partial u, partial y. This notation though, this notation is um, succinct. And so it's just, um, it's it, if you use succinct uh, notation, what happens is you have less distractions in your equations and the fewer distractions, the easier time your brain has in understanding the equation. And so that's why succinct notation is useful. So here are some examples. Is, is um, suppose u is x squared y and v is x y squared, is that analytic? No. What about if u and v are both x squared y squared? No. What if u is x squared minus y squared and v is 2xy? Ah, yes, it's analytic.
Okay. So here's an example of a function analytic at a point, one over z minus z zero. Um, it's analytic. And in fact, it's analytic everywhere except at uh, the point z zero. I unfortunately said analytic at a point. It's analytic everywhere except at z zero where it's singular. And this singularity, by the way, is what we call a pole. And um, we'll, we'll discuss that in, in, in a few sections uh, from now. Um, we can see that you, if we write F now in terms of U and V as U plus IV, turns out U is rather complicated and so is V. It's this more complicated expression, but you take the derivatives, the partial derivatives with respect to X and Y of U and V, and you find they do satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, except where they both blow up. Okay, so um, that's the, the basic thing, that a that differentiability in the complex plane is a bigger deal than differentiability in the um, in uh, the on the real axis because it means that the ratio goes to a constant. The ratio of df over dz goes to a constant, no matter how dz approaches zero. Whereas in the case of uh, ordinary calculus, you're either going to approach this way or you're going to approach that way, but you're not going to screw around with any vertical directions. Um, whereas in the complex plane, you have to do both. And so the notion of differentiability is different. And the test of, uh, and if you're differentiable about a point in a, or if you're differentiable in a disk of a certain radius, then um, you're said to be analytic in the disk and um, if you're analytic in the disk, well, how do you know if you're analy a function of analytic in the disk? The, in the disk, the Cauchy-Riemann conditions, which are um, written um, right here, uh, tell you where here, of course, f is equal to u plus i v. Okay, so that's that. I hope is well. Uh, I don't think. I think I think you need to think about that. Look at the examples that I skipped over um, uh, to fully absorb that. Um, and and the, the, the funny thing about complex variable theory is that essentially it all follows from this definition that um, I've just given you and. Um, that's one of the things people like about complex variable theory, namely that it's it's a theory in which all the ducks are lined up. I don't know what that expression means. Um, I hope it doesn't mean people are shooting ducks. But anyway, um, you uh, it's it's a case where once you understand completely that definition of differentiability and analyticity. Well, that implies most of complex variable theory. It all just follows as a consequence. Um, so it's a very neat theory and, uh, and, and, and therefore it, it's fascinated many people and in fact, sometimes overly fascinated people. Um, the next topic is one that I used earlier in the course, namely that, um, that the integral uh, of an analytic function any analytic function along any closed contour is equal to zero and this is the Cauchy integral theorem notice this is a closed contour and the idea is that we're talking about some region say R uh, of analyticity. So this is a region of analyticity. That is to say the function f is analytic throughout this region. 
And so let me say that throughout this region, the function is analytic. And so if you take any closed contour, in other words, it goes back to itself like that. And typically we integrate counterclockwise in, um, of course you could equally well integrate clockwise, but um, anyway, if you uh, integrate counterclockwise or or clockwise along any closed contour you come closed means you go you start at some point and uh you come back to that point and that's that's what this little uh circle here means this circle means closed contour c the c means contour not closed but the zero or the O on the integral sign means um, uh, close integrating along a closed contour. And you always get zero as long as the, the um, contour lies entirely within the, the uh, region of analyticity. And um, not only that, but the area, the, the region within the contour has to also lie entirely within the region of analyticity. So you can't have, this theorem uh, fails if you have a region of analyticity with a hole in it. Then if you're integrating in a closed contour and you have some singularities here, then the integral theorem no longer holds. So what we say here is that this region of analyticity should be simply connected. And um, simply connected means that you can take any loop and shrink it to zero while staying within the, the set. Whereas here, if you try to shrink the red lasso to zero or red contour to zero, you're going to have to leave you're going to be you're going to go inside that black hole and, and leave the region of analyticity and um sorry for all the unintended puns anyway so let's see if we can prove this um let's just do some lead up to it by various examples although in a sense this example these examples are are kind of um basically the whole story in some ways so let's integrate um, along a rectangle. So we're going to integrate along a rectangle u plus iv. And uh, first we're going to integrate from 0 to l along the x-axis. Then we're going to integrate up the y-axis from l. Then we're going to integrate backwards parallel to the x-axis, but at a height h above the, uh, the real axis. And then we're going to come back down to the original point. So in other words, this contour is one. Here's the complex plane. We're going to start out at um, 0 here. Maybe I should do black now. We're going to start out here, and we're going to integrate along here to a point L, we're going to go up to a point H, we're going to go back, and then we're going to come back down. So that's the, that's the idea. And uh, what is this? Well, the real part of the integral is going to be uh, the difference of the U's. Uh, uh, here minus there and uh, minus the um, the difference of the v's on the you see on the zero to h uh, legs in other words this leg and that leg you're integrating i dy and so you pick up the v's. And on the other hand, the imaginary part is IV integrated horizontally 
and uh, you integrated vertically. And um, well, what is uh, the this uh, integral? Well, it's obviously a uh, this integral is going to be the integral of the y derivative, the difference of a, a u of u at x zero minus u at x h. Well, it's minus the y derivative of u integrated at x along y from zero to h. Similarly, v l of y minus v zero y is the x derivative of v integrated from zero to l. So these are the things that we need to stick in here and uh, in these two positions. And so we get that the real part of this, of this rectangular integral is an integral zero to L, u of x zero minus u of x h, but that is minus the integral zero to h of u of the y derivative of u. And so altogether it's this area integral. And then the other part is this y integral of, of this, and that's vx, and so we integrate that. So what we've actually got is an area integral of u sub y minus a plus v sub x, but that's zero by the Cauchy-Riemann conditions. And similarly, the... Um, difference is v minus uh, v of x zero minus v of x h and u of l y minus u of zero y are integrals of the y derivative of v and the x derivative of u and these are the things that occur in these expressions and so when and so the imaginary part of that contour is simply this and this also vanishes because of the um cauchy riemann conditions And so this Cauchy, the second Cauchy-Riemann condition means that the real part vanishes. The first Cauchy-Riemann condition means that the imaginary part difference, uh, uh, um, that the imaginary part uh, vanishes. So this is, um, of course, I, for simplicity, did a, uh, a rectangle of arbitrary length and height, uh, but one that sat in the, in the, uh, first uh, rectangle, so to speak, of the first quadrant of the complex plane. But obviously, a part of the notation would be more complicated, but the, the proof would be the same for any rectangle anywhere in the complex plane. We'd still get zero as long as the function f was analytic there. And in fact, if it's analytic throughout the complex plane, then every closed integral about a rectangle, um, all rectangles, um, uh, if um, f of z is uh, entire, uh, which is analytic everywhere, which in turn means differentiable everywhere. Everywhere. And that also means uh, the Cauchy Riemann. Ooh, let me just undo that and switch to this. The Cauchy Riemann conditions conditions hold. And um, so um, now when if you think about um, an arbitrary contour integral, well, you can make an arbitrary contour integral by putting together rectangles, can't you? Um, in other words, you, if you want a contour that's kind of like that, then you would use a little rectangle here, another rectangle there, and so forth. And now if you put two rectangles together, 
what's going to happen? Well, you're going to be integrating like this on one integral. And then on the other one, you're going to be integrating this way. And so the sum of the two is just going to be The sum of the two is going to be just this integral. So that's a bigger contour integral. And so if you imagine filling up this entire region with tiny rectangles, and they can be arbitrarily small, then um, you can make um, you can you you can arrange that the outer that what's left over is just the integral. Wait a minute, wait a minute let me switch to this. That the that's what's left over is just this integral along here, and all the interior ones cancel. And in particular, for the, for this particular case. These three edges would would remain and would not be canceled, but all the interior vertical and horizontal slabs would um, all the interior vertical and horizontal uh, integrals would cancel the way these two canceled here. So that that basically is it. That tells you that the uh, that's a proof of the Cauchy uh, re, the Cauchy integral theorem um, that the integral along a contour of an analytic function along a closed contour vanishes as long as the contour entirely lies within the region of analyticity, no holes in it, and in particular that means that it should be the region should be simply connected. The, the, the contour should wholly lie within a simply connected region or equivalently a region without any holes. And um, uh, an example is a uh, tiny circular. If you do a tiny circular closed contour, what you have is the function at any point on the contour is given by f of z0 plus f prime of z0 times z minus z0. dz is, is, uh, is i epsilon e to the i theta, d theta. And so we have this particular integral here, uh, this integral and that integral. This integral vanishes because the integral e to the i theta from 0 to 2 pi vanishes. Um, no, I'm sorry, does that, right, that vanishes. And then this one is e to the, the integral e to the two i theta from zero to two pi, that vanishes. So these two integrals uh, vanish. And if you can, if you used higher powers, f prime, f double prime, you'd have um, extra powers of z minus z zero. So you'd have e to the i n theta and it would automatically uh, vanish. Uh, I don't know why I have a tiny square. I guess it's a little bit easier to. Um, an integral along a tiny square. All right, if it's a tiny square, we just keep the dz's and we have epsilon, i epsilon going vertically. So in other words, along the square, this one gives us epsilon. This one is i epsilon. This one is minus epsilon, and this one is minus i epsilon. These are the dz's, and uh, f, uh, f of z zero z, z is close enough to z zero that we don't need the extra terms, and um, but they also vanish. Um, so that's another way of uh, thinking about it. Um, so that's basically it. Um, and uh, this, as I said, in complex variable theory, one of the things people like about it is that they um, 
that everything follows from the definition of differentiability. And so in particular here, um, we, um, we're considering four different ways of going from this, four different contours from this point to this point. These are not closed contours, but um, we can conclude that the integral, as long as F is analytic inside this whole region, then the integral along this contour is e of F along this contour is equal to the integral of F along this contour. And that's the same as the integral along this contour. And that's the same as the integral along that contour. And the region is reason is that if we say that this is the uh, integral along C1 and uh, let us say this is the integral, I'll call it C4, then we know that if, if we're totally within a region of analyticity, this thing vanishes, but this is the integral C4 of f of z dz uh, minus the integral C1 f of z dz. And this then is a contour integral of f of z dz. Because that particular integral goes along here and then backwards along this. So we have this minus sign. So that tells us then that if you if you have a, a region of analyticity that's simply connected, then you can go from any point to any other point along any old curve and you're always gonna get the same value. Whoops, I did not want to do that. So these are um, all different ways of um, integrating from one point to another. All these contour integrals are exactly the same because the initial and final point of the of the trajectory of each trajectory is the same and we're assuming the functions analytic within uh, this entire region and um, there are no holes no poles nothing like that um, so that's um that's more about Cauchy's uh, integral theorem and uh, in particular, it means if you have a z to the n, that function's entire, integrating from um, or integrating around a contour. Um, this d uh, z to the n dz is d of z to the n plus one over n plus one, and since you are doing a closed contour from z zero to z zero, you evaluate z to the n plus one twice at, but at the same points you get zero. So the integral of any polynomial around a closed contour vanishes. And then the difference between a polynomial and essentially everything is that, um, you know, the limit of a polynomial as you let m go to infinity, that's a Taylor series basically for an arbitrary function. And so these are all uh, these these are all analytic functions, and the contour integrals of all of these automatically vanishes. I'm talking to my dog. Um, uh, on the other hand, one over z minus z zero that diverges at z equal to z zero, and so uh, all all bets are off um, uh, when you integrate. Um, f of z around the point z zero, you do not get zero. And in fact, that leads us to the next topic, which I really hesitate to start um, because um, 
you know, I don't want to teach you everything today. Um, that's just putting too much stuff into your heads um, at once. But I don't know what else to do. So let's consider we have that we have a function f of z that's analytic in the simply connected region R. Remember, that means simply connected means the region looks like American cheese, not like Swiss cheese. And um, that z0 is a point inside the region. And what we can do is we can integrate f of z over z minus z0 around a tiny closed contour around the point z0. So let's do that. Well, uh, since f is analytic, it's very, to a good approximation, it's just f of z0 plus f prime of z0 times z minus z0. And notice you can do z minus z0 because the direction doesn't matter. Um, uh, and then you have to, okay, that's that. Then this is a dz. dz if, z, if we're doing a circle, z minus z0 is epsilon e to the i theta, d theta is i, epsilon e to the i theta d theta so you just differentiate with respect to theta here and you get this express this this thing is dz and then z minus z zero well that's epsilon e to the i theta the epsilon e to the i theta is cancel and we just have this expression here the um e to the i theta integral from zero to two pi vanishes but f of z0 integrated is just 2 pi f of z0, and then we have an i left over. So now what we have is an example of Cauchy's integral formula, namely that f of z0, that is to say, here's z0. Um, and we've done a, an integral a circular integral of radius epsilon. So this integral of um, contour epsilon f of z over z minus z zero dz, we found that that is just f of z zero apart from a factor of two pi i and conventionally we write the fact of two pi i out in front. So that's Cauchy's integral formula. And it's, it's of course, a miniature version. Um, on the other hand, we just learned that, uh, what are we doing here? We were integrating from this point counterclockwise back to this point, but we can equally well consider let me just write z0 again. Uh, and let me go back to this point here. Instead of integrating, so one, one possible integral, oh, Christ. One possible, the integral we did was just a very small circle. But if this is inside a region that's simply connected and analytic, and it's a region of analyticity, then we can just as well integrate. Now here's another contour going from the same place to the same, from the same point to the same point, and uh, we get the same number. And now here's, uh, let's see, here's another one. Oh, damn it. It's so annoying. There's another contour. And what one have I not used yet? Well, here's yellow. And this one's going to be a funny contour like that. And um, then we can do black, I guess. Um, and uh, this one. So the integral along every one of the along every one of these contours 
we're going to get the same thing. We're going to get uh, that one over two pi i integral closed contour f of z over z minus z zero dz is f of z zero um, for all of these contours. Um, and uh, what else though? Well, this point, there was, we can move this point actually, because we could move that point over to here, say, and then what would the change be? Well, um, the we could do a contour that would be the following. It would start at this point. Oh, wait, I wanted to stay with, you know, let me undo that. Let me stay with this, but now blue. So we could start here go out to this point, do an arbitrary contour, come back to this point, and then go down here. And so what would we have? We'd have two different integrals along this line between the original starting point and ending point to another starting point and ending point. And in fact, that different starting point and ending point, it, it could be that it would be over here. So in other words, we'd start at this point, we'd go down this way, go along an arbitrary contour around Z zero, and then where the hell did I, this thing is playing games with me. We go back to this point, and then we go this way, back to this thing. Now these, the contour where we integrate one way and then along the same contour in the opposite direction, those two cancel. And so what we get is that as long as we have a region of analyticity, then one over two pi i f of z, over z minus z zero dz is f of z zero. Any contour C that goes around. So the basic thing is that we have here a region of analyticity. So this is analyticity. No holes in it. So simply connected. And uh, we have some point here, Z zero, and we do an arbitrary counterclockwise integral contour around Z zero, no matter what it is, we always get two pi i times F of Z zero. And that, that is um, Cauchy's integral formula. Sorry, I uh, have gone over. I didn't mean to go over, but I will record this and post it. So those of you who had to leave early uh, can just watch it on YouTube. Um, so I'm gonna stop recording now because I'm way, way over time here. So 